What's good, YouTube? This your boy Lane, man, and I'm back here with another reaction video slime. And right now, I'm about to react to the Green River Killer, Gary Bridgeway. And this one is from Serial Killer Files. And before I get started, you already know. Um, well, if you knew over here, you probably don't know that. Yeah, obviously, you already know that I do the music reactions. Like, bro, we all know that. You feel me? But if y'all knew, y'all probably don't know that I other, you know what I'm saying? That I other. Y'all don't know that I probably do other videos, like these type of videos, like the forensic videos, the funny videos, like, you know what I'm saying? Different videos from outside of the music reactions. Like, obviously, the music reactions not going nowhere, you feel me? Like, they, we, we gonna keep them cracking. Like, those are never going nowhere, but, you feel me? Some days, I just like to take a break from doing music reactions certain days, you feel me? And I do the funny videos and the fr forensic videos, bro, like... Don't trip, bro. You feel me? Like, the music reactions, they not stopping. You feel me? And I just want to let y'all know because I know I got a lot of new people coming over here. You feel me? So, that's for the new people. But if y'all already over here, y'all already know. We do the forensic videos, the funny videos, the music reactions. We do them all on the channel. You feel me? Like, we doing it all. Like, I told y'all before 2021 started, like, at the end of 2020, that I was going to come with more different type of videos in 2021. Obviously, I was coming with the music reactions, but I was coming more hard on the forensic and the funny videos too because I didn't really do them that much last year, you feel me? And a lot of people that was, you know what I'm saying, getting up getting up to me, like getting up on me, they're like, bro, do more of the funny videos and the forensic videos, like, you know what I'm saying? Because you go on YouTube, everybody's doing music reactions, you feel me? And... Not a lot of people do other reactions than music, you feel me? And I don't want to be thrown in that music reaction box. That's why I do different type of videos, but you feel me? That's just what it is, but we doing them all. Like I said, we doing the music, the forensics, the funny videos. Like, we doing it all over here. And y'all probably don't even know about the Green River like that. Like, me personally, I know about bro, but I don't really know the whole story. So this one right here should be very interesting and... We about to get into this thing, Slim. This that Green River Killer by Serial Killer Files. Let's get into this thing, Slim. Let's go. Gary Ridgeway, the Green River Killer, a man so torn between his intense sexual desires and his staunch religious beliefs, it led him down a path of death and depravity for which mm. he would become known as one of the most prolific serial killers in history. Let's open the Serial Killer file. Mm. Gary Leon Ridgway was born on February 18, 1949, in Salt Lake City, Utah, the middle son of Thomas and Mary Ridgway. Gary regarded his early life as uneasy. His mother was a domineering, abusive woman who verbally abused him and his brothers, and his father was a meek man who used physical punishments against his sons. Mm. Gary had a bedwetting problem up until his early teens. Late bedwetting is often considered one of the signs of a serial killer in the making. His mother would belittle him and force him to be bathed by her when he would wet the bed, often while wearing a revealing robe. This carried on until his early teens, causing both anger and sexual attraction towards his own mother. His father introduced him to the idea of necrophilia, telling him stories of a necrophilic co-worker at a mortuary he worked at. Gary liked the idea because having sex with someone who is dead, you wouldn't get caught. No feeling. Bro, see, bro, that's sick. Bro, you having sex with dead people, bro, that's sick. Like, you gotta really have something wrong with you in the head. You feel me? And this is why I tell y'all, bro, especially if y'all got kids, bro, watch what y'all do around y'all kids. Like, because whatever whatever you do around your kids, bro, influence them, especially as little kids. I don't care what nobody say. Like, if you do anything in front of a little kid, they gonna wanna do it. You feel me? So, bro... Just take care of your kids, like, and don't do no crazy shit, you feel me? Like, take care of them. 
She wouldn't feel it. Due to his tumultuous home life, he began to grow mentally disturbed. Gary was still only a teenager when he attempted his first kill, the victim being a six-year-old boy who Gary stabbed viciously. The boy, while bleeding, asked Gary why he did it, and Gary said he always wanted to know what it was like to kill somebody, while he laughed and walked away. Thankfully, the boy survived, but not without a surgery that left a foot-long scar. Gary had an IQ of about 82, quite below average intelligence. He struggled throughout school, causing him to graduate at age 20 in 1969. After graduation, he took a job as a painter at Kentworth Truck Factory, joined the Navy, and married his high school sweetheart, Claudia Craig. During his tours in Vietnam in the Navy, Gary began using the services of prostitutes, leading him to contract gonorrhea. Despite this, he continued to see prostitutes and had unprotected sex with them. After he returned from the Navy, he learned Claudia had been having an affair, and the two divorced in 1971. This brought Gary great turmoil. He referred to his ex-wife as a whore, despite attempts to reconcile the marriage. Bro, you can't call her a whore or anything while you was doing the same thing. You feel me? That's being, what's that word? That's being a hypocrite. You feel me? Like, you can't get on somebody for doing the same thing you're doing. You feel me? Like, bro, you you already a goofy, a goofball. You feel me? Like, you're already a goofball. <laughs> Straight up. Gary eventually remarried to a woman named Marcia Winslow a few years after his divorce, and they had a son named Matthew in 1975. It was during this marriage that Gary began to show a darker side of himself. Marcia claimed Gary had choked her and demanded sex frequently. He also became devoutly religious during his second marriage, reading from the Bible often, preaching throughout his neighborhood, crying after church sermons, and demanding his wife adhere to strict biblical teachings. Despite his religious devotion, however, his insatiable desires for sex grew to the point where he would demand Marcia engage in sex with him in public places, sometimes in the places that the bodies of his victims would end up being discovered. Mm. Despite his new marriage, child, and religion, he still used the services of prostitutes in the area. He was torn between his convictions and his voracious needs. This marriage would ultimately not last, and Marcia eventually filed for divorce in 1981, gaining primary custody of Matthew and ordering Gary to pay child support. The rejection of both his wives, the anger and lust he felt towards women, and all the events in his life that led up to his current situation made him overflow with rage. It was in the summer of 1982 that Gary's thoughts of murder and sex finally boiled over. The first Green River victim to be found was that of 16-year-old runaway Wendy Lee Caulfield in July of 1982, mm. having been strangled and her body dumped just outside of Kent, Washington. By September of that same year, the bodies of five more women would be found within the vicinity of the Green River and the surrounding Seattle-Tacoma area. Gary felt as though women had a control over him, lying to him, causing all of his problems. He chose prostitutes because of his hatred of them. He found it was easy picking them up. Gary admitted to having a fixation with them and despised them for what they were, but was unable to stop himself from using them. He later told investigators he would show the women a photo of his son to gain their trust, even going so far as to bring his son along to pick up some of his victims. While partaking in a sex act, if the woman did not cooperate with his request or something were to anger him, he would strangle her. If he felt an urge, he would return to the bodies and perform acts of necrophilia on them until he was unable to do so due to decomposition. Over time, he hid bodies farther away from his home in an attempt to deter his necrophilic urges. In 1985, Gary attended a Parents Without Partners group where he met Judith Mawson, a woman five years his senior. They dated for two years before moving in together, and she would become his third wife in 1988. Gary would describe his marriage to Judith as extremely happy, Judith regarding him as the perfect husband. 
and Gary found himself and his urges to kill calmer while he was with her, and he used this to motivate himself to end his merciless killings once and for all. In his work locker, he carved the letters NKDK for no kill, don't kill, to remind him what he had at stake if he kept killing. Judith remarked that when she first moved in, he oddly had no carpets and he would leave for work in the early hours of the morning under the guise of seeking overtime pay. She claimed she never once suspected anything and knew very little of the case due to not following the news. Ultimately, despite his relationship with his wife, Gary could not contain himself forever and he continued to kill. Gary was arrested twice on charges of solicitation in 1982 and 2001. He was first suspected of being the Green River Killer in 1983, but was able to pass a polygraph test in 1984, though later analysis revealed he had actually failed. Police took hair and saliva samples from him in 1987, but due to DNA still being in its infancy, he was released without further questioning. By December of 1984, the body count had risen to 42 victims, and the Green River Task Force was formed that year. The task force was consisted of detectives from King County investigators, including David Reichardt and Robert Keppel, who had interviewed Ted Bundy on occasion. Bundy even offered his own interpretation of the Green River Killer's mentality. He suggested police stake out any fresh graves they found in order to catch the killer revisiting to commit necrophilia. But by 1998, the victim total reached 46, and the task force had little to go on. It was finally in 2001 that DNA from the first five victims concretely linked their cases to one another, and the DNA collected from Gary in 1987 was finally confirmed to be the Green River Killer. Gary was arrested on November 30th, 2001 at Kentworth Truck Factory. He was initially indicted for the murders of Marcia Faye Chapman, Cynthia Jean Hines, Carol Ann Christensen, and mm. Opal Mills, and later Wendy Caulfield, Deborah Bonner, and Deborah Estes, after paint fragments found on the victims' bodies were linked to the car paint used by the factory Gary worked at for nearly 30 years. It's crazy how, bro, it took them into 2001 to catch this man, bro. Like, bro, you you were sick in the head. Like, bro, you had problems, you feel me? Like, And I don't show no sympathy for you, bro. You deserve... If hell is real, bro, you deserve to go straight there. First ride. Swear to God. Because you, you, you out here killing for, bro, you out here killing for your own amusement. Like, so, like, bro, something wrong with you, bro. Like, you, you need a, mm. Prosecutors were set on sentencing Gary to death. However, instead, it was decided that closure for the families of the victims was a better outcome. Sheriff Reichardt interviewed Gary in an attempt to extract more information from him, but he remained elusive. Finally, in a deal set out by his lawyers, Gary Ridgway pled guilty on November 5th. No, don't cry now, fam. You wasn't crying when you was killing all them girls. Like, don't cry now, bro. No. Nah. Nah, you get no sympathy. What you crying for? You wasn't crying when you were killing and doing all this weird stuff with the dead, the dead bodies. You the, the, don't cry now, bro. Mm. 2003 to 48 counts of aggravated first degree murder in exchange for his cooperation in locating the bodies of his other victims. Mm. He was sentenced to 48 consecutive life sentences on December 18th. He led investigators to the grave sites of Pammy Avent, Marie Malvar, and April Buttram in 2003. He also pled guilty to the murder of Rebecca Marrero in 2011 after her skull was found near the location of Marie Malvar's remains, making her his 49th confirmed victim. However, Gary confessed to a total of 71 murders in his over 20-year career, as he called it, but he admitted he had killed so many that he had lost count. Today, he remains in Washington State Penitentiary at the age of 68. Good, bro. Because you don't, bro, they, honestly, to me, they should have sentenced you to death, bro. Like, 
to me, they went light on you, you feel me, in my opinion, because, bro, you killed, bro, you killed a lot of, a lot of people for no reason, you feel me, so you get no sympathy for me, you know what I'm saying, like, uh, you could die in there all I care, straight up, you feel me, and I don't wish death on nobody, but when you do stuff like this, I don't got sympathy for you, bro, I don't, you feel me, and like I said, um, if y'all know over here, we do these type of videos, you already know, the music reactions, they gonna be, stay coming, you already know, like, they ain't stopping, you feel me, and like I said, y'all make sure you hit that sub button, I love y'all, y'all stay safe, and I'm gonna get at y'all next time, slime, that's crazy.